Good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. Welcome back. This is our first meeting for 2020. We are here at Cooper's Point School, and I would just like to have the principal, Ms. Casello, to come up and give you a welcome. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am Janine Casella. I'm the proud principal of Cooper's Point. I'd like to welcome you, parents and staff and central office folks. And Ms. Wilson, thanks for coming. And thank you for coming to our building, using our building. I also have some former students here that I'm like, oh my gosh, they're parents now. So that just tells me how old I am. So thank you. Have a wonderful time. And it's really nice to see all of you out here sharing your information with everybody and making us all better. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Ms. Casella. Ms. Tracy Cooper is our FOC. We'd just like to acknowledge her. We have a few words. Good morning. I just want to thank you guys for all coming. Um, Happy New Year to you. Looking forward to a brighter year. Um, all of us, you know, basically changing the narrative and helping out all the kids. Um, I just appreciate you guys using the building here. And if you're, when you're done, if you want to take a little tour, hang around. I'm willing to walk y'all through. Thank you for coming. Thank you. At this time, I would like to acknowledge Ms. Sharma, Maria Sharma, but she's not here today, but she is the president of the BPAC. I also would like to acknowledge Mr. Kevin Barfield, who is the secretary for the DPAC. Also, he is the president for the Special Ed Committee. I now would like to introduce you to Ms. Mary Coogan, Esquire, Vice President Advocates for Children of New Jersey. She is here today representing the state of New Jersey to give you information on the census for 2020. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. So as uh, Ms. Wilson said, I'm from Advocates for Children of New Jersey. We're a statewide nonprofit. We're located actually in Newark. I'm here because Ms. Wilson was at an urban school board meeting on a Friday night in Trenton. She works very hard. And I was doing a census presentation. And of all the districts who asked us to come out and do a follow-up, she's the only one. So. If you're happy with the presentation, you can thank her. And if you're not happy with the presentation, it's my fault, not her fault. OK. So Advocates for Children of New Jersey, we are a statewide nonprofit. We put out the kids count data, which some of you have already taken, our pocket guide, which came out in November of 2019. And we use this data. It's not our data. Much of it is related to the census, which is why the census count, which is coming up this spring is so important to us, especially children under the age of five who were not counted. There were many who, 27,000 we estimate in New Jersey who were not counted. So we have our zero to five representative who's here with us today. And it's really critical about the census because it matters for 10 years. They only do this census count every 10 years. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about it. We also gave you some handouts. Um, that you have at your places. Ms. Wilson, I'm gonna give her a flash drive with, which, with this presentation on it. It has a script that goes with it. So any of you can give this presentation to community people, to your neighbors, to the families you work with. And also the materials that um, you have in front of you are, are also available in English and in Spanish, okay? ACNJ, we are privately funded and we receive some funding from some foundations to try to distribute as many materials and get the word out. So let's start. Okay, so I'm just gonna go through some basic census 101, talk about some operations, some tips, and what you can do to get involved in the census, all right? And give you a little bit of background. Okay, so what is the census? The census occurs, this part of the census occurs every 10 years, okay? And the whole, it's required by the Constitution of the United States, and the whole purpose of the census is to count every person who is living in the country, and we are concerned about every person who is living in New Jersey, from birth all the way through end of life, okay? Who's actually residing here? It is a national survey. It's coordinated by the US Census Bureau, okay? And it's for everyone. It's 
people of all ages, races, ethnic groups, and citizens and non-citizens. Some of you may have heard months in the past where people were discussing whether or not they were going to put a citizenship question on the census form. There is no citizenship question. That is because the law does require that every resident be counted. So why is the census important? It's important for New Jersey because nearly $23 billion every year is given by the federal government to the state of New Jersey, okay? That's a lot of money. That's 23 billion with a B, not 23 million. And so whatever our census count is for 2010, that determined that we get $23 billion a year. In 2020, there'll be a new count. And based on that count, for the next 10 years, the federal government will allocate the money that comes to New Jersey. So we need everyone to be counted so that everyone can benefit. It also determines how many representatives we have in Congress, in our House of Representatives. How many senators do we have in New Jersey? Two. Two, two right? How many in the House of Representatives represent New Jersey? We don't know that as often, right? No. Well. In the last census in 2010 and the census before that, New Jersey lost one member of the House, okay? So now we have 14, but we actually used to have 16. <clears throat> Here's some of the programs. I'm hoping most of you recognize these programs, right? These affect all of us. So the census money funds transportation, it funds health care, and it funds schools. That's why Ms. Wilson wanted me here today, because you're all about the schools, but you're also helping families, and many of these families actually access these programs, okay? So family care, as you know, that's part of CHIP, which, and Medicaid funds family care. The majority of it is related to Medicaid. SNAP, we used to call that food stamps, right? That's funded based on the census. Section 8 housing vouchers, special education grants, school lunch program, Head Start, WIC, child care but also clinics, okay? Also Medicare. A lot of times seniors don't say, well, it doesn't affect me, but Medicare funding comes to New Jersey based on the census. All right, so what are the questions that are gonna be asked? This is a very short form. This doesn't take a lot of time, okay? So it's going to happen Online this time, it's going to happen by phone and also the paper. How many of you are old enough to have been involved in the 2010 census, right? It was all a paper form. So this year is the first year you're gonna be able to complete your census questionnaire online. And it's actually what typically is thought of a census day. Uh, April 1st, right? Well, actually you're gonna be able to complete your census form prior to April 1st, starting in March. Okay, so here's the calendar. Sometime starting March 12th, every household will get a mailing, a document in the mail, which will have a unique identifier number based on that address. And that will be an invitation for the household person to go in, connect on the internet to the Census Bureau website and complete their questionnaire online. They will get another follow-up form to say, in case you forgot, here's your invitation again, here's your unique identifier. If people don't fill it out online, then you're gonna get the reminder postcard and then you're gonna get the paper questionnaire form. So, couple of things. If people don't want, oh, and then if you don't fill out the paper form, a census worker will come out and knock on people's doors, okay, to actually ask them the questions. If people are concerned about a government person coming to their home, to me, that's incentive to say to them, fill it out online, okay? Because if you fill it out online, no one's gonna be knocking at your house, okay? The other thing is people will be able to call the Census Bureau if they don't feel comfortable filling it out online or maybe their literacy skills don't make them feel comfortable filling out the paper form and they will be able to call a number and have a census person ask them the questions by phone, okay? So, this is just to tell you it's kind of hard to see, but this is a map of who's going to get the first mailing and who's going to get the second mailing and who'll get the updated form, okay? It's not, I don't, we're not going to spend the time going on the detail. All right, so, 
This is another, the initial contact form. Okay, so again, the operations is, the invitations will be sent to the household in March. April 1st is Census Day, but this whole period is considered the self-response. The Census Bureau will begin visiting, knocking on homes starting May 1st for any home that has not completed the census. So for all of for the March and April, the Census Bureau, because they have a big database, they will be able to track all the responses that they have, and that's how they know who didn't complete their census form. And again, it's by address, and then they will start knocking on doors, okay? And then in June, they will be knocking on the doors, and then they wrap it up by July 31st. I have a question. Can you go back one screen mm -hmm. to where they, yeah, that, so, because I just wanted to know, because I see where it's preferred, hand-delivered packets or internet choice mail-in, internet first mail-in, and I just wanted to look at that. Okay. What that was about. Uh, That's fine. The other thing is, I know that Ms. Wilson will be emailing this PowerPoint to everybody, so you'll have it, okay? All right? Mm -hmm. All right. So, one thing we do want people to understand, that there, are, there were census people out in neighborhoods trying to make sure that they had an accurate picture of all the addresses. So you know <laughs> since 2010, Buildings have changed. Buildings have been knocked down. Apartments have been built. So there were census workers out earlier this year making sure that they had all the addresses. Because the mailer comes based on the address. It doesn't come, like my name's Mary Coogan. It doesn't come to my house, dear Mary Coogan. It comes to my house with an, a unique ID number to my address and says household member, OK? So one of the things that people should know, though, if someone came to their door, and said they were a census worker, they should have an ID, okay? And it should have a watermark on it with an expiration date, and if for some reason they have some concern that that person is not a census worker, there is a number they should call and report that person, okay? All right, so these are the basic questions that they're asking of every household. They're asking the name, the age and date of birth of everyone living there, the gender, race, or ethnic background, and then the relationship to the person of the household. So if I complete the form for my household, everyone who's living with me, including my niece who lives with me, and then a friend who's just been staying with us, I would put all of their information on my census form and say what the relationship is, okay? It doesn't have to be only relatives that I complete and add to my census form. And then the other question they ask is whether you own or rent your house. So that's it, okay? It's really quick. The main thing is if people are gonna fill it out online or if somebody's gonna have a, a spot where people in the neighborhood can come, you really need to remind people that the age and date of birth is important. Because a lot of times, if you have people staying with you, you don't necessarily know what their date of birth is or their age. Okay. This is information the Social Security, or the, I'm sorry, the census worker will never ask, and the form will not ask. They will not ask for a Social Security number. They will never ask for money, and they will never ask for credit card information. So if somebody came to somebody's house and asked for this, that is a scam. My understanding is, is a lot of seniors are concerned about a scam, okay? So it's important for us to tell them as well as everybody else, that if someone came to their house and said, I'm a census worker and asked for any of this information, bank or credit card, donation, money, social security number, they are not a census worker. People should shut their door and report them to the census, okay? All right. The other good thing about this year is there will be telephone numbers that people can call, as I said, to fill out their census form on the phone. These are all the languages that will be supported. Spanish, Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, Russian, Arabic, Tagalog, Polish, French, Haitian Creole, Portuguese, and Japanese. That's new this year. In the past, it's basically been English and Spanish. All right, so if somebody gets the invitation to fill out their form online, they don't feel comfortable because of their language issues, they can call the Census Bureau and someone with, who speaks, if they speak one of these languages, will get on the phone and ask them the questions. That makes sense to everybody? 
Okay. So, I mean, I think the Census Bureau is trying to be helpful. All right. Anybody have any questions about the information I covered so far? Good. On your way out, you go all get a button because you can answer questions about the census. You're now all census champions. <laughs> it's not hard, okay? The first time I gave this presentation is because a colleague's wife had a baby and he went out because the baby was born and I didn't know what I was doing either. But you can walk through this. It's not hard, okay? So what's the challenge in New Jersey? The challenge in New Jersey is that we have a lot of ethnic groups we have a very diverse community, and we have what we call hard-to-count populations. Now, in the past, a hard-to-count population is defined as people who were unlikely to complete the census form and mail it in. It doesn't mean that they didn't ultimately do it, but they did not do it on the first round. And they tended to, have, to require to have a census person come out and follow up. So our goal, the people I'm working with on a statewide coalition, is to try to get as many people in the hard to count populations to fill it out the first go around, just because it's helpful, but also because the Federal Census Bureau does not have as much money this year to go send out workers to go knock door to door. So again, this is basically the steps that the Census Bureau is going to take, so we need to concentrate on the hard-to-count populations. All right, so these are some of the populations that are considered hard to count. As I said, children under the age of five. Last go-around in 2010, we estimate we missed about 27,000 kids who are under the age of five. People of color, non-English speakers, immigrants, and renters. So while it's important to get the word out about the census to everybody, it's really important to try to focus any outreach we do on what we consider to be hard to count populations. So not that this is an exact science, but people do have some reasons why they think the hard to count populations typically don't respond to the census. Obviously, if people have a language issue, right? And typically in the past, it was in Spanish and English only. We're hopeful that with all the other languages, that are available to help people, more people will fill it out. There is definitely a mistrust or a fear of government, okay? One thing I say to people is that if you remember the questions that the Federal <coughs> Census Bureau asked, they're pretty limited. And we all give more information to our banks, to our child care providers, and our schools than what the census is asking, all right? And just keep that in mind. And if you remind people of that, we're hopeful that they'll say, you're right, you have a point, okay? We share information all the time online about ourselves, okay? Now, some people live in what we consider to be complex households. There could be multiple families living at the same address. The Census Bureau wants everybody in both families or all three families to be counted in that one census response, okay? Sometimes kids go between two different households. They spend time at a grandparent's, they spend time at a parent's, they spend time at an aunt's. Wherever they lay their head on April 1st is the household who should count that child. In the past, the paper form ended at nine spaces. So if you had not more than nine people living at a particular household, people just stop filling it out. And that's how we think we lost a lot of the under five, right? Because they would be the last person put on the form if you went down by age. On the online application, you can continue to add more people. Sometimes people live in multiple unit buildings and all the addresses aren't counted. So if people don't get an invitation with the unique ID number, it doesn't mean they can't fill out the census form online. They just go online and they say where they live, what the address is, and then they identify everybody in their household. Sometimes we have people which I call couch surfers. How many of you have had a friend of one of your kids or a relative staying with you for a short time? That winds up being four, five, six weeks, you know, three months, a year, right? Okay, so we all know. Now, what's happened is a lot of times those people don't get counted because we don't think of them as part of the household. But if they have been primarily living with you and they are going to be in your household as of April 1st, they go on the census form as part of your household. And it's really important to get all those people because a lot of times those are the people who are actually accessing the services. And so we want to make sure the services are coming to where those people are. 
All right. So we talked about the complex household, multi-generational, unrelated families. And the other is children living in foster care. If you know any people or any of you have taken in children as foster care, if they are with you April 1st or they're going to be with you April 1st, they get included on your household four. Okay, you can go, the census has a link to maps that show the hard to count populations also at www.censusnj2020, census NJ no, census 2020 NJ, I'm sorry. That's a link to our website. You can also find the hard to count uh, maps. All right, and they have different maps for the different populations. Okay, so how can you assist? First thing, say to people, it's not gonna take them more than 10 minutes, all right? Again, it's important to remind people to make sure that they have the birth dates and the ages of all the people in their household when they do it. Obviously, it will take shorter time, but even if they don't, they should still include that person's name. The census is safe, it's confidential, and protected by federal law. Census workers take an oath, and if they divulge information from the census, they can go to jail, and I think the fine is around $25,000. All right, and they take that for life. It's a very serious thing. Okay, we're counting people where they live most of the time. As I said, technically it's wherever they put their head on a pillow on April 1st. All right, and here's just some tips. Things like the newborn. I'm thinking of newborns. If they're in the, still in the hospital on April 1st, they're still going to be counted in the household of their parents. If you're living with unrelated relatives, count them. If there's a foster child living in your home, count them. Is your relative without a home or temporarily living with you on April 1st or a couch surfer or a non-relative, do we count them? Yes. yes, we count them, okay? So the idea is you want to make sure we count everybody. Now there is a thing called group quarters. So for instance, people who are in nursing homes, people who are in hospitals long term, people who are in prison, detention centers, et cetera, there's another method by which the Census Bureau works with the governments in those areas to count those people. So we don't have to worry about that. All right, college dormitories, they are considered group quarters. So if you have any children who are away at college, they will be counted. If they're there on April 1st, which they should be, they will be counted at the college where they are, all right? If kids are commuters and they live in an apartment, okay, they go to Camden County College and they live in an apartment, they should complete a census form and include all of their roommates who live there. Correction facilities, nursing homes are all group homes, okay? If you forget to include someone, you don't panic. You can always go and add them, okay? So if you do the form online and you don't finish or you're not sure about somebody, you can go back on online at a later date and fix it. Don't forget the baby. That's our big push because I work at Advocates for Children of New Jersey, okay? All right. So um, now the other thing is while... I am giving you a census presentation. I don't work for the Census Bureau, right? I work for Advocates for Children of New Jersey. So some people are gonna be asked, especially different nonprofits or schools or faith-based community um, people to actually open up their facility and allow people who don't have access to the internet to come in and fill out the census form at their location. If any of you get involved in that process, we're calling it like a kiosk process, I think it's a wonderful thing to do. We need people to do that. But one of the things you should let people know if they ask you to help them fill out the census form, that you're not a census worker. You're not bound by the same confidentiality rules. And really, you can answer their questions, but it would be better if they actually completed the questionnaire on their own. And if they have still have questions, that's when it would really be good to call the Census Bureau and have the census person just ask them the questions on the phone. Okay. So. Anybody have any questions for me? Because I don't want to overstay my time and share the information. Now, one of the handouts that I gave everyone is what we call the household scenario. 
handout. We just finished that last week. It has just been translated into Spanish. It will be available on our website, and also it's on the flash drive I'm giving Ms. Wilson today. I think this is a really good document if people have questions about whether to count somebody who's living in their home. The college dorm situation, the foster care situation, those are all on that sheet. So if you read that through, you can answer questions for people. So the last thing I want to talk about is jobs. The census has to hire many, many, many people. I've heard numbers like, I don't know, 66,000 in New Jersey, all right? These are to do all the follow-up, to go knock on the doors from people don't fill out their form to make sure they fill it out or to ask them the questions. One of the things I've heard from census people is we still in New Jersey have not hired all the people we need to hire. This is a temporary job, meaning you're only gonna be working like April, May, and June, but you could work part-time or you could work full-time. And my understanding is it's paying more than minimum wage. I've heard numbers like $18 an hour, $20 an hour, et cetera. So if any of you are looking for extra work, even part-time, this is an opportunity and you can go to the census website and apply. The other thing that they are really looking for is people who speak more than English. Okay, and ideally, they would love people to be walking around in their own neighborhood because if you were a census enumerator, they're calling them, or a census taker, in your neighborhood, you know a lot of people that live by you, and so they're not gonna be as hesitant to open the door. Okay, so you can apply at the Federal Census Bureau website if you're interested, or if you know any other people who are looking for work and need work, we need more people. We definitely need more people in this part of the state because we have a lot of hard to count populations. And the Census Bureau is definitely looking for people that speak more than English. Not that, if, like me, English is my only language. I know a tiny bit of French, not to get me anywhere. But they are still looking for people who just speak English as well, OK? Um, so I would encourage you to put the word out. I know. So it's January when put the air conditioner on. Don't take that. <laughs> They'll be saying you're wasting money. Okay, anybody have any other questions? All right, so please help get the word out. Join the Camden Complete Count Committee. Help Miss Wilson get the word out in the schools. There's lots of materials. The more people you talk to, the better we will all be. And it's really a good chance that we'll have a complete count. But thank you for your attention. <laughs> Help me um, thank Ms. Mary Coogan for coming in today and sharing that most important information for us. Um, not only did I think it's important that we get the information out for the numbers for the funding to come into uh, the state of New Jersey for this our city of Camden but also the fact that it's an opportunity for employment for our parents and for even our workers, our FOCs, or anyone in the city of Camden. So $18 an hour is, you don't have to work full time, but it will help to put some extra income into your household. So once again, help me thank Ms. Mary Coogan. Mr. Kwame Ford from the Department of Education. I would like to bring him up now to have a few words with you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul May Floyd. I'm coming from the New Jersey Department of Education today. Um, we're really just here in support of the district. There's going to be um, a couple of pretty cool things that are happening. Um, within uh, some of the schools, uh, most particularly at, at VETS, where the district and the state and school are, can you guys hear me back there? No. Okay, sorry. My voice doesn't carry that well, and I'm a little nasally, so I'm gonna try my best to, oh, I have to hold this too? Yes, yeah, sorry. Lock, 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 sorry. Right now. <laughs> um, so at, the, at VETS, uh, the district, the school, and, uh, and the state are working on uh, some initiatives to bring some more resources there to house some of the central office um, uh, family supports there uh, and, and it will be culminated with a welcome center 
Uh, there'll be more information coming about that in the, in the weeks and months to come. But the idea, just at a very high level, is that the school and the district will be able to provide some resources at the school um, in a more accessible way. Um, we'll be working with, well not we, but the school and the district will be working with various groups to see if we can get some of the services that are happening at different schools, maybe housed at one place so people have easier access, um, whether that is for um, some of the services I think around uh, medical, I think there's some um, things like the, the dentist on wheels or other different programs and we're trying to see if we can house them more centrally so that people have greater access to it. Again, I think there's gonna be information coming out um, of it, the state just wanted to come here in support of the efforts that are happening. Uh, this is a, this group here has been, um, oh, sorry, the state was informed that this group was very important uh, to be informed about what's happening um, at VETS or whatever work we're doing. So we're just here for that reason. Uh, there'll be more information. I, I can take a couple of questions here or there, but um, just wanted to hear it from us uh, that these efforts are happening. Assistant Commissioner for the Department of Education also reached out to us, who is working along with us uh, in our endeavors within the city of Camden as we continue to move things forward, dealing with Title I, um, different uh, departments that we are coming together to make things better on behalf of the Camden City School District, on behalf of the Board of Education. Uh, the Commissioner is putting the commissioner has been putting out a commissioner's report. Some of it talks about things that are a part of the superintendent's report at the end of, uh, at her meetings on a monthly basis. They're talking about district priorities and updates, uh, pre-college internships, a great teacher in every classroom, great stuff for every role. District priority, safe schools, built for 21st century success, long-term school planning. So these are the type of information, this is the type of information that's going out. Also, stakeholder engagement. Some of these pictures you've already seen if you have been to the Board of Education's um, monthly meetings. So this was actually mentioned on behalf of the Assistant Commissioner. And at this time, we would like to bring up our very own Ms. Karen Campbell. She is the director, senior director of grants for the Camden City Board of Education. And at this time. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Nice to be in front of you again. Happy New Year to everyone. Um, this is a little, how's it going? Okay. Okay, any questions you wanna throw at me? Requisitions you have questions about? Or anything like that? <laughs> Okay, once my PowerPoint comes up, I'm going to start without it in the interest of time. But basically, I'm here to talk to you about parents' right to know. How many of you have heard that term, parents' right to know? Parents, I should see all your hands up. Parents, you haven't heard that? Okay. So let me ask you, what does that mean to you? Like, what do you think it means, parents' right to know? Exactly, that was very well put. Parents, you have a right to know certain things about your child's education. You have a right to know who is in front of your child educating them. You have the right to know how your child's education is gonna be assessed, meaning how is this school gonna tell me my child is learning? What are they gonna do so that I know my child is learning? Parents of English learners, you have a right to know that your child has been put in a classroom to learn English. All of these things are under the law. Now ideally, prior to October 15th, the school should have sent a letter 
or notified you somehow via email of your right to know. So I should see every hand go up, right? Because you all got that letter, right? Okay. That is a legal requirement. And we say by October 15th because what good does it do if we tell you that in May? All year has practically passed and you weren't informed what your rights were about knowing who's in front of your child, how their learning is going to be assessed, or that your child is in a class for English learners. So I'm going to talk about three areas in which you have a right to receive information. The first is, again, about who's in front of your child educating them, teacher and or paraprofessional. Number two, testing transparency. You are entitled to know certain things about testing above and beyond when it's going to happen. Also, again, you are entitled to be told within a certain time frame that your child has been identified as an English learner and is going to be instructed as such. You're going to turn the lights down? Can you guys see the? Okay. So with the right to know piece, this is on instructional staff. So you have a right to know, and this is relative to the area in which your child is being instructed. So if your child is being instructed in ninth grade science, it's relative to that. If that science teacher meets the state qualifications and licensing for that assignment. So you need to know that Mrs. or Mrs. Mr. or Mrs. so-and-so who is teaching science, if they have the proper credentials, you have the right to ask about that. Because let's face it, you may want to take some action. This is empowering you. If you feel that your child being in a class with someone who doesn't have the proper credentials is going to harm him or her academically, you need to know that. And you're empowered to know that and then make a decision as a parent. You have a right to know if that person is operating under a waiver. There are certain hard to fill areas in which people who want to teach can get a waiver. New Jersey is not as liberal with waivers, but in some states, let's say um, they have a need for um, teachers of students with disabilities. They will just waive the certification and say, come on in. So you have the right to know that. If the content area that the person is teaching matches the certification. So especially, let's look at science. Okay, you're supposed to have a, si a certification for whichever area of science you have. So if my certification is in biology, but I'm teaching chemistry, is that a match? No. No. No, it's not. So this is to empower you to let you know you have the right to ask this information. And by law, it has to be provided to you. Now, some people say, well, what else can I ask for? You can't ask for personnel information. You can't ask for grade point averages or all of that. But you have the right to ask for these things. Does this person in front of my child meet state licensing requirements? Is this person teaching under some type of emergency certification or provisional status? Is he or she teaching in the content area that he or she is certified in? And if your child is receiving instruction or instructional support from a paraprofessional, you have the right to ask about his or her qualifications as well. All of our schools here are Title I schools, so our parents have to meet certain requirements. You have the right to ask, does Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so who is assisting with my child's instruction meet these requirements? And this is all under the law. Any questions before we move on? Yes. empower you to make a decision and that can be held that decision can take several paths first of all and I can only say what I would do if I were in that situation I would want to find out from my child does he or she feel that this teacher is adequately instructed him or her because just because I'm not saying they should be teaching if they don't have a certification but you may have someone who was a minor in physics but they're certified in biology 
Okay, you also may want to learn your options about what are other placements for my child. If it's a high school and there's no one else certified um, to teach physics, that may be the only option you have, but this empowers you. It empowers you to make a decision. Okay, any other questions about this instructional status? So testing transparency. How many of you have heard of NJSLA? New Jersey, what is it? Okay, it used to be park, but it changes every year. Okay, how many of you know when the test is gonna be given? They send out notices, okay. You don't have to wait for them to send you notices. You have the right to know certain things around state assessments. Okay, back when part first came into um, existence, there was a lot of conversation around students opting out. Now, New Jersey as a state does not have an opt-out policy, but the district may have an opt-out policy. You have the right to know what does that mean. For example, if my child opts out and doesn't come, is he or she gonna be considered excused for an absence or unexcused. If my child opts out, um, what's gonna happen on his or her transcript? Will it look like he or she did not pass the test? You need to know what those policies are. Which subjects are gonna be assessed? We know that in upper grades, secondary level, we have you know content area tests, which ones are your child gonna take? You know what they are in the lower grades. You have the right to know all that information. Yes, ma'am. Where was he? Okay. A school cannot opt out. Okay, so you're saying he didn't take the test? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Now, with students with an IEP, there's two parts to this whole testing thing when it comes to accountability for a school in a district. You have to have a certain percentage of students who take the test because back in the dark ages, let's call it like it is, we all knew that when it was time to take the state test, they would send certain kids to the movies because they didn't want their score counted in. So with NCLB, all of that changed. So schools and districts are held accountable for a certain percentage of their children taking the test and a certain percentage meeting the standards. So all students have to take the test, whether they are special needs or not. But some students who have an IEP are exempt from passing to graduate. But regardless, the child should have been taking the test unless he or she officially opted out, and then you have the right to know how that will impact your child. Jill, do you want to add anything? Sure. Um, so there are some students with, hi, I'm Jill Trainer. Um, I am the Chief School Support Officer for Special Services, so special education is under one of my buckets under me. Um, some students with IEPs actually, um, depending on their needs, they may take the DLM, which is an alternative assessment for some of our kids that have higher needs um, and can't take the general ed test. So no matter what, everybody is taking something and then some kids may be exempt from passing. Does that help? Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> You have the right to know what was the purpose for this test. What is it designed to tell me? Is it des designed to tell me how my child is performing against the norm, or is it designed to tell me if my child is meeting certain standards? So you have norm reference tests. How are you performing against the norm? How are you performing against the criteria? What is this test designed to tell me? Why the child has to take the test? What is the source of the requirement? Is it in the state? Is it a state requirement? Where does it state that? Is it a federal requirement? Where does it state that? You have the right to know that information. And where you can find all of this. It's all public information, but who has time to research and research? You have the right to go to your school and say, I wanna know where this requirement is. Um, how much time students are gonna um, spend taking the assessment? 
because of our new assessment systems, it doesn't just happen in a day or two, it happens over an extended period of time. You have the right to know what that means for your child. How long is he or she not going to be instructed? And a few years ago, we had a lot of issues with students who were taking the access for L's, and that's the test that English learners take to see how they're um, meeting English proficiency standards. And for some of those kids, while they were being tested, they were receiving no instruction, which should not be. Schools have to somehow design the testing. We know when it's supposed to take tests, it's supposed to take place, but the school has to design a schedule with minimum interruption to a child's academic program. So you have the right to know how much class time is my child going to lose because of this test? And time and format of dissemination. When am I going to find out how my child did on this test? When am I going to get that information and how am I going to get it? Is it going to be mailed to me? Do I have to go on the website? So this is all around testing transparency, things that you have the right to know. Okay, again, you can wait until you get the letter that we're going to be testing the weeks of whatever, whatever, but you can be proactive and say, I know my rights. I want to know um, how long the test is going to take for children. I want to know what it was designed for. Um, I want to know uh, what subjects my child is going to be tested in. So this is part of your right to know. Did you have a question? Any questions? Yes. So I know prior to Uh, you, to my is that to my knowledge, the following school year. Yeah, that's, the schools I know they get them in the summer. Yes. So is there a way to get the I could follow up on that. Jill, what do you do? You know? Um, I, I don't know if it's Stand up and say that. <laughs> I said at Kenna High School, I know when the district mails them out, um, our, our guidance department lets us know that they're in. And using the prior to the school year starting, we'll do like a back to school barbecue, the information session, and that's when we get on to the Which I think is ideal because. As a parent, ideally you want to get that information as early in the school year as possible so you can take whatever actions you feel you need to take. I mean, if you get the test results back and it says your child is performing below average in certain content areas, you need to have questions with the school about what programs or services do you have for my child to perform better in English reading, whatever. Any other questions about testing transparency? The last area is language instruction. This is for parents of English learners. Um, within 30 days of the school year starting, if your child is going to be in a bilingual program, an English or ESL program, you, you have the right to be notified of that. You should be notified within 30 days of the school year beginning. You should receive notification that your child has been identified as an English learner and will be receiving whatever type of services the district offers. Some offer ESL, some offer bilingual classes, but you should receive that information within 30 days of the school year starting. Now let's say your child comes in after the school year starts. Within two weeks, parents should be notified that their child has been identified as an English learner and is gonna be placed in a program to help learn English. So you should have received that information. If not, you need to have a conversation with your respective schools. Um, and how it's given to you, that's important also. If we're dealing with English learners and we're communicating with their family, 
we know that this child goes back to a home where the um, language that's spoken is Spanish, it wouldn't make sense to sing that letter home in English, would it? And we don't want to use a whole lot of jargon either. We don't want to say your child is whatever percentile, da 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 da. It needs to be in a language that parents and families can understand, their native language, and written in a way that it can, their parents and families can understand. That's a requirement by law. You have the right to ask for that. And if they don't have that information in your native language, you have the right to ask for a translator, someone who can help translate that information to whatever language you speak. So it's important with our English learners, parents of English learners, you should have received that information. That information should tell you also the average time that students spend in an ESL program, that's important too. If you get information that this program that is being offered, the average time a student is in um, the district's ESL program is five years, you might want to take some other action. But this is all about empowering you as parents, what you have the right to do. And this is all in the legislation. I can give you the citation. I'm not making it up. It's in the law. Parents' right to know. So I just want to reiterate those three areas. Instructional qualifications, you have the right to ask certain questions about the people who are educating your children. You have the right to ask information about the assessments that your child will be given. I'll give this to Ebony. And you have the right to be informed that your child's gonna be in a program so he or she can become more proficient in English. Those are your rights. Any questions? No? Okay. I'll be here a little while afterward if you have any questions. Mr. Barfield, yeah? You looked at me like you want me to ask you a question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I want to ask a question. Uh -huh. So basically you're saying that it's, it's the parents role to make sure Ideally, yes. The district has to provide the information saying you have the right to ask for this, but you have to be um, assertive and you have to ask for that information. By law, the district has to tell you you can ask, but you have to initiate the inquiry and then they'll give it to you. And I think the challenge is that for some parents, you may not attend certain meetings, like, for instance, rather it's the picnic back to school, and, you know, welcoming during you know, that time of the year or maybe that back to school night. It's like, how do we make sure that parents understand, you know, that you know, this information is out there that they need to know about so they can you know, make sure they know and understand that process. I talked about that parents' right to know letter, and that's the letter that the school should send to parents saying these are your rights to know certain things. Now, there's two ways it's supposed to be disseminated according to the law. It's supposed to be disseminated directly, and that can be emails or U.S. mail, but also it has to be disseminated on a wider basis, and that could be something like putting it on the school website that you have the right to know these things. So there has to be two forms of dissemination. So we can hit parents you know, who don't come to those events like the barbecues or whatever, but who do look on the website. Okay, I'll be here later on if anyone has any questions, but thank you for your time, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. I would also like to recognize Ms. Jill Train. I would also like to recognize Ms. Jill Trainer um, for being here today. Her department is very instrumental for the things that um, we as the parents need to know on behalf of our children. Ms. Eileen Ramos, who is here, we appreciate it. Uh, Ms. Campbell, Ms. Okaford, all of them, they normally have the answers for the issues and concerns that we would have. So once again, I'd just like to say thank you to all of you for being here. I would like to thank Ms. Ebony Henson, who is the Senior Manager for Family Community uh, Partnerships. She is working with us 
as a committee through the Title I, the DPAC, the BPAC, and the Special Ed for technical assistance for getting us information out to you due to the fact that we no longer have a home for our um, parent center is no longer in place. So therefore, the information that we get out, she's helping us to get that information out to you. I would like to thank Sheena for all of the work that she does on behalf of us. Um, Ms. Joy Marshall, who is with us, she works along with Ms. Ebony Henson. She makes sure that we have a location to go to on a monthly basis. And so with that, I would just like once again to say thank you for your attention because I know we had a lot of things that was disrupted. I know that it was warm in here, we're tight, but the most important thing is we're here on behalf of our children. That's the reason that we come out. And so with that, our next meeting will be February the 13th. At that time, we will basically be hosting, the DPAC will be hosting the uh, special needs meeting next month, February 13th. A flyer will come out to you through Ms. Henson's office, uh, letting you know what the location will be. And once again, information that we gave you today, if you can't use it, make sure you share it with someone else. If you need extra copies of anything, it's here. The information that was given out to you on the commissioner's report on what's taking place within the district this year, you are also welcome to pick that packet up. And all of our FOCs, we're asking you if you will pick up the Kids Count, which is the booklet that's over on the desk over here. So that will help you with um, working with your parents in your school. It gives you the data for all of the different um, locations within the city of Camden. So once again, I want to say thank you, Martha Wilson, Chair of Title I Parental Involvement, and we look forward to seeing you next month. Yes. Oh, yes, yes. I apologize, because normally I do say that. I don't have it on my paper. This is what we do two weeks. This is what, this is what happens when you're working two, two o'clock in the morning. So I think that I did say thank you to all of you for coming out. So once again, who's here? The FOCs and the parents. The parents are here because the FOCs bring them. And that's the reason that we have those positions. You're the key, and I always said, when you were the community school coordinators, that title changed, but you are the glue to the household for our children so that they don't fall through the cracks. So once again, thank you all, and we look forward to seeing you next month on February the 13th. God bless.